when uh, I first encountered Dungeons and Dragons uh, in the summer between seventh and eighth grade. Uh huh. Um, that there, it's impossible to describe just how not like it was. I mean, how how not like D and D it was. Oh, okay. That's yeah. the uh, in terms of product, in terms right. of you know people are used to the idea of saying okay, well Dungeons and Dragons is the flagship game, so when you walk into a game store, there's going to be this library there, and right. the library, the books have the same bindings and they have the same uh, you know kind of they have this, the, they are yeah this sort of they indicate look to them. yeah they yeah. indicate to you that somebody has a sense of identity for these things and that they have an identity. The thing has an identity. Right. And then at the time, really, you know, it, it, it didn't have the power of an object of a text then. And yeah, so, I, I thought yeah. that part of your, um, your four part series on D&D, uh -huh. I thought that was really brilliant. No, yeah. thank you. Um, I think it was a little deranged, but, uh, uh but I liked it. <laughs> Um, Brilliance is yeah. often deranged. Yeah, no, that idea that it was a cobbled together, right. not a single text, but mm -hmm. that we pulled from all these different resources to create the game mm -hmm. that ended up at our table. Well, in the case of Holmes, um, it was probably because the the original pamphlets were uh, few in number, and the distribution was very spotty. In other words, whoever, the, the, a lot of places that had them had them because a guy knew a guy. Right. And so out of that realm, you really, I mean, most of the, they, the, the stores received a lot more Dungeons and Dragons promotional material than they actually received Dungeons and Dragons. Right. And that makes the, perfect sense. And they were, Upon the game being bought by the Bloom family, which was very, very soon after its first release, they wanted a product that wasn't just these little crappy brown pamphlets. And sure. so this is where Holmes comes from, was sort of this desperate effort. Um, I mean, the the promise of, a, of an advanced D&D &D coming one day was in place almost immediately. The idea that you would toss out this basic thing that you would play first. I don't know how strategic that decision was or how desperate that decision was. Right. I see what you're you know? saying. And, um, and so I'm very, I could keep going on, but really I want to know what it looks like to you when you pick it up. What are some of the things about it that just strike you as utterly unexpected or unique or what? Well, I mean, unexpected is hard because I also picked it up when I was seven. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Although I was, it was my brother who got it, who was four years my senior. And so I, I saw it from the end of player as opposed to mm -hmm. dungeon master. Um, but yeah, we had the, you know, we had cut up the chits. You told me about the chits. I saw you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So we had used the chits because we didn't have polyhedrals. Um, so it's very familiar to me as an object because I must have looked through it. You know, every page is a single page. Nothing. The binding is totally shot. Oh, oh, I see. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I had looked through. I, I must have looked through the pictures and read bits and pieces a bazillion times as a kid. But I hadn't I hadn't read it as a text until just now. Um. I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic text. It's a whole uh, quirky little yeah. freaking thing, isn't it? Yeah. It was It was surprisingly of a piece to me. I mean, I, I, so I'm so interested to hear your thoughts because, you know, I, I, so we played, we started playing in 77 and then we pretty much had a campaign. That so it was completely still. simultaneous with me in this regard because the, the, that, that was the year for me. So yes. Oh, it was seventy nine for me, not, not okay. seventy seven. I think mm -hmm. I think it must have been seventy eight or seventy nine. I was only like six or seven. Still very um, very close. And yeah. yeah, it was mm -hmm. it was pretty early mm -hmm. on. Um, but once again, it was really my brother's hobby, and I played along. It's not like I was getting right. friends together right. to do mm -hmm. it. I was playing in with his friends. 
Um, so then we played through like 89 or 90, and I don't know if he ever got the second edition books or if we just kept playing with his first edition or the AD&D. He, he, so he got the hardbacks when they came out, as, as I must say experientially, as one must have done. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Because you didn't want to play like, you know, that old one. The ob- I was told. In fact, <laughs> awesome. I remember in eighth grade I was holding Holmes and I was so excited to have it. And I was in seventh grade. And I, I actually got pieces of it. I never actually had the box. I had the blue book from my oh, friends. Yeah, yeah. We had when the he, box. Right. Yeah. Well, because, you see, I got it from my friend. He didn't want right. it anymore. But all I got was, like, the book and a couple of things. I never <laughs> owned Yeah, I didn't have the box. Right. So, um, or maybe I did. God, it's so, it's so hard to remember. But I it didn't have all the pieces. Time ago. But the point is that um, I was crushed. When one of my friends saw me in junior high and sneered, that's obsolete, you know. Oh, you know? because he had the A, B, and B stuff? Well, the Monster Manual had just come out. And the player's yeah. handbook was being, you know, was. that was was being chatted about in, in Dragon. And everybody see, knew, you know, the new era was upon us. The sun of D&D would finally shine down. We'd actually have, like, the real <laughs> one, you know, here. And, I mean, we had the monster. You could see the monster manual. It's a hardback. I mean. It was a great holy book. Holy shit, I that book, right? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It's a hardback. Oh, my God. It's a book. Like a book yeah. book. And so, you know, the whole idea of, of, you know, the Holmes thing. And so I sort of sadly. But as you might imagine, upon any reflective return, the ease of knowing what the fuck you were here to do and how compared to advanced Dungeons and Dragons, those three hardbacks is night and day. I mean, it's, it's fully understandable that somebody would take Holmes and say, you know what? We could codify this and give it more levels and call it a game. And yeah. that's oh, when yeah. Moldve is made just a few years later. And then Menser, of course, is a somewhat, I would say, RPGA massaged and refined version of Mulvey. Um, and so, uh, and that tracked all the way along. It was this whole line all the way up through the cyclopedia in the early 90s. I mean, it's right. a whole line of D&D that is a completely different role-playing game. And most of the people I know who value it have either Moldve or Menser as their Bible. Um, yeah, and but, I didn't, I wasn't even familiar right. with those names until right. and, the last and, two years when I came right. back to it. And what what and I can kind of see why because I think a lot of those got out first of all. I learned a D and D with all of its demons and devils mm. had been pilloried by a great deal of the culture. And especially in certain venues, certain regions. Sure. And those regions, now I'm just speculating here, but I think the Moldve stuff, which is much more light and friendly and doesn't really have all that, you know, dedicated, you know, there's, right. there's no tits in Moldve, right? And, and, they, and there's, there's more than tits in AD&D. And well, so, there isn't even in here the harpies in here. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. Yeah, but but and that has that has it. But the Moldve and the Menser stuff is actually very focused on that cleaner approach. Gotcha. And so yeah. and so, I think a lot of people those were their game. I think a lot of them, if they even knew about Holmes, thought of it as kind of a failed or you know like a weird first installment of Moldve. Right. And so. Right. And I still get that today. I say, oh, Holmes is my jam. And people are like, oh, well, you know, but it's not a real game. It doesn't go past three levels. You know, it doesn't have, you know, it's it's, it's not complete. Oh, my God. I know. That's really surprising. Well, it, it's a different vocabulary. If you're sure. coming backwards and saying that it is essential to D&D that you level up past a certain point and et cetera, if you say that's essential to your notion of D&D, then, yes, Holmes is not complete. It doesn't do it. I mean, I guess, but, but, but you have to have that image, does. right? <laughs> I mean, that's the only thing that it fails to do is go above third level. I mean, even its monsters go well above. Yes, that's true. Um, and its spells go to where you are. You know, it gives you up to where fifth level would. Go. Yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, but true. Although I'm remembering its 
rules for that are, are interesting. If you go, ah, whatever. The point is that you are looking at an object which I find eminently playable. And also playable in its Absolutely. quirky features. I mean, here's my favorite quirky feature, which is ridiculous. Which is right. that uh, there's no ordering for combat. You just pair up. And so there's no initiative role in Holmes. There is an initiative role. Isn't? Uh, there's only an initiative. It's by dex. Right. So it's not it's a not roll. roll. But right. if your dexes See? are even, wait, wait, then I, you roll. Yes, yes. But keep listening. No dex value is given for the monsters in their blocks. That, no, and it says, yeah, no, no, and so it says, you're supposed decks. to roll, but listen, that's quirky as hell. It tells you specifically three die six per monster, no other guideline given. So all of a sudden you've got your monstrous monster who's slow. He's got a dex of four. Yeah, you don't know, right? You roll. He could have a dex of four. He right. could have a dex of And so 18, I, yeah. I did this, and the last time I played it, um, I did this and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. It says to do it. And I got the weirdest assortment <laughs> of one of the most important features of a monster. Sure. And it just yeah, created, it it created a monster. bizarre, bizarre assortment of foes that really didn't match to how powerful they were at all. And that's so, so it was. And that's what I mean by quirky. You're looking at this weird thing and going... I'm running with it, right? I'm running. With, it's clearly a, it's clearly a desperation device in the text, you know, textually. It's there's no design in that. They just had to figure out what the hell to do and scribbled in a line as they went along. I mean, it's very clearly. Yeah, I mean, and, you think they just ran into it like their thinking was just like, well, monsters don't have stats, so how do we give them a dex? Right, and and, and not only that, but I think it probably the way they played, they just said when until some day some player said why. Right. Can't I go before the monster? What's its dex? I see. And the, yeah, and the, and the guy at the right. table's like, oh my god, well, um, <laughs> I can't out argue this player. So here I'm going to you know roll and probably oh, roll dex, well, well yeah. probably fudged it at the table. And then, you know, to make them go faster or something. And then, you know, the, in went the line just because they had to fill it in to keep that player happy, theoretically. And, I mean, in other words, like it, it, it stinks. Well, it, it, it stinks of that process, which is a very common phenomenon in role-playing design. So, um, so the, but I find it delightful in its absurdity. Yes. That's what I'm I talking about. Why. It's not yeah. good design, but it certainly means it is odd. And it and it's enjoyably odd if you embrace it and say, you know what? Yep, the orc is cheating. Shitty decks. Yeah. It says to me that the game was played a lot. Yes. I mean, now, it doesn't yes. mean that it was played and then they decided how to make a great rule out of it, but they were like, we played. Right. It works. And so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. The whole thing is very baked in play. That's one of the first things about it is that it doesn't pretend of of every of all the textual editions of D and D, it puts on no airs. In fact, it's the only one Absolutely. that I can think of that doesn't like rub its pectorals in your face and say, "I am D and D." <laughs> no, it is an underground comic of a game. It is that, and it yeah. feels like it. It reads like it, and it plays like it. Um. Yeah, I had a wonderful time when the spirit yeah. of playfulness about it. Too, right, right. Where it's like, make up your own spells. Run them by yeah. the GM. That's <laughs> know, important. But make up your own spells. Yeah. You know, you've got the beginnings here. Go do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. There's a there's a weird openness to it, and there are things that are are interesting to contemplate. Um, if you go back to the original pamphlets. Um, of 1974. Okay, yeah. Um, you will find that the cleric is the build. The cleric is the badass. Oh, is the that right? The cleric is just the, I mean, you got the armor, you got the spells, you've got the, the damage yes, they do can be can phenomenal. Everything. Yeah, the, the cleric is like the metal holy warrior of the bunch. And the, the magic user is a baby bird, you know, and the fighter's kind of boring. And, and the, the cleric just kind of strides on there and says, I am here to chew your bubblegum. And, gotcha. um, 
And then in Holmes, the there's a, I don't know, there's a weird assortment across the classes that I find less, I don't know, they're, they're, it's almost as though they kind of flattened them out in effectiveness a little bit. There's a little more balance in effectiveness. Nice. But on the other hand, there it's, it's hard to describe. There's almost a, well, I don't know what it is either. You know, to in, in text, you know, what's a cleric? I don't know either. I mean, there isn't this kind of... Right. Yeah. In, the, in the case of Gygax's prose, he's always writing as if he knows something and will say things like, of course, blah, dot, dot, dot. Uh, or, I mean, and that's not a necessarily a bad thing. He had a very strong feeling for what fantasy was or fantasy literature was. But you got the idea that behind the rule, there is this way to do it or way to look at it that you're supposed right. to be doing or that smart people knew. Right. And so there's none of that in Holmes. He's like, man, here's your fighter. What's a fighter? Fuck if I know. <laughs> you know? He doesn't even bother to define the stats. Exactly, yeah. So yeah. He's, he's like wisdom. That's for clerics. Right. Okay. Right. I, um. Yeah. Why define it? Why? Who needs to? What's right. a cleric? Why define it? Who needs to? Go on. Yeah, and so you, you basically it's sink or swim in that sense. As far as the imagination is concerned, sink or swim, look at the illustrations, if if they strike you, go, you know, just go. Yeah. Well, now, because the AD, imagination right. isn't even really necessary. You don't need to know what a cleric is if you have his stat. Holmes is kind of interesting though, because you have to improvise a lot of things in order to play. So you've got this weird numerical organized, you know, my number against your number, roll the dice thing going on. Right. But whenever, but then when you introduce positioning, who pairs up? You know, things like that. So you find that the right. combat itself requires a lot of... Yes, you end up with... Problems. Unless everybody just sort of, like, marches into position and starts hacking in a boring <laughs> way, right. which can happen. But if you don't do that, then all of a sudden you get kind of a crazy improv, you know, jumping off the top of this... Jumping off the top of the statue. Nothing. There's nothing that makes you roll for jumping off the top of the statue to cut the guy in half. And no, so, therefore, if you get into that, then all of a sudden everybody's doing it. Right. And it's That's a little, I'm not saying it facilitates it necessarily or that it, the game, like, helps you do that. But there's a whole, but there's, there's, there's very it. little, there's very, very little you can't in that text. That's what Absolutely. I'm getting at. So, if, if your mind steps you over into, well, then I do this. It's surprisingly open to what you might think of as director stance, just saying what's there and running with it. And it doesn't have the same it doesn't have the same thing that you get in the modules for RPGA that were to come where you really just lay down exactly what's in that room. And so um, you know, and Holmes has very, very little historical textual adventures to go with it. Compared to any of the others, there really isn't that much to go on. Um, and I find that it was, uh, you know, it, it to me, that material tended to have a little more weird openness to it than the march through the quest that you got in the later stuff. Um, but that's just me. Maybe I'm projecting that. There's, How do you mean that? I don't think I understand well, what you mean. I, I, so, like, I read, I to, to go I, with this, I read uh, In Search of the Unknown. Right, right. And what? How would you characterize it as a as an adventure text? What's your read take it. on? I read. Okay, so I read the lead up to it. Mm -hmm. I didn't read the actual room okay. by room stuff. Um, so I'm interested. What do you? How do you mean it's different? I would have to go back and review. Sure. So that's why I'm being reluctant. Is because okay, I'm, I'm I'm wondering: I Am I projecting anything. this? Am I projecting this? And I'm not saying they were like these wide open, you know, story anywhere kind of scenarios. I'm saying that they felt and i'm thinking very much in comparison with the a d and d stuff that was done sure. um that's very classic stuff done later right. um well, and so maybe i shouldn't gen maybe i shouldn't unknown, generalize yeah go ahead though yeah into, into the unknown it doesn't put the monsters and treasure in there 
Right. It gives you a right. list at the back of the book of like 35 treasures. Oh, that's so right. many monsters. Yeah, and you throw and them in. And it says, yeah. when you get to a room or, you know, when you're filling it out, roll a die. And if it's a one or a two, then there's something in that room. And right. you put something in there. Right. Because only a third of the rooms should have mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Um which I just thought was fascinating. So, I mean, in some ways, it's a it's a teaching manual. They see it as a teaching manual. Well, it's you very clear. Your own it's, dungeon. We'll right. give you the map. We'll give right. you a couple cool traps and rooms. But that's a really good itself. insight. I consider it to be very much a teaching text to say, okay, now that you've done this, now run off and do it yourself. You know, yeah. here's in that sense, it has this kind of punky quality of, well, okay, I, here's a few chords to play. You know, they might even kind of suck a little bit or make no sense or whatever, but that's up to you. You just go and go run with it. Go do something. Uh, Tunnels and Trolls Absolutely. has a great deal of the same quality. Tunnels and Trolls is, is interesting in comparison as having a much more philosophically grounded approach than any D&D &D did when it said, make your dungeon and every dungeon should be an expression of the and it's kind of implied of the darker instincts of the actual designer the actual dm That's you actually cool. that that every D, yeah every dungeon kind of has some kind of avatar or you know animus <laughs> some anima of the dm That's lurking really in cool. it down there and that that it, you almost were kind of inviting everybody into some sort of sadistic or humorous <laughs> or creepy version of yourself that they got to delve What's into it's actually cool. pretty pretty explicit in saying that's what you're supposed to do. Um, not even in an insightful way either. I mean, you're just doing it to like create, you know, a bonkers, you know, some sort of, of joke, really, that, the, right. that sooner or later they would get it when they... Right. Um, so the, uh, the thing, too, that I wanted to emphasize, uh, one last thing, really, if anything... Uh, is this well you said playfulness and you said teaching text and all of that is true and i was talking about the lack of pretension it, involved yeah. um which i think is very and that pretentious is mean because that makes me sound like i'm calling gygax pretentious shall we say portentious right okay but a, yeah. a good, that, that would be my my word for the gygaxian perspective of writing this material is a sense sure. of portentiousness and um, the, you know you could you, that may not be a criticism. You certainly could say the same thing about the Glor the Gloranthan writings too. So, mm -hmm. sure. But uh, but let's take a look at at Holmes instead. And you have a sense of we came to play this. You know, we came to play it, and it is uh, and and it has a uh, an immensely grabbable. You know, you really want to pick it up and go. Um, and I think that's probably why I think of it much more of as an instrument of play rather than a text to absorb and to adopt. Oh, so I yeah. think that's part of my, my biggest love for it. And um, it gains yes. a lot by wanting to simplify the systems. Mm -hmm. It gains a lot. It gains a lot by saying... Look, every every weapon you have, it does one d six. That's damage. right. Mm -hmm. You know, so don't don't worry about. It. You don't need to complicate exactly right. what you're doing there. Uh, you know, if you go to open a door, you've got a one in. You know, if you roll a one or a two, you open the door. Fighter, whether you're a wizard, whether you're strength right, or great, right. it doesn't matter. It's right. Presumably, the doors door doors got to open. Doors got to open or not open. It's just one right. two. We right. don't need to complicate that. Right. And so right. there's there's. I don't know. There's a beauty in that sort of simplicity of just reducing. You, you talked about reducing, but but uh, but historically speaking, reducing from what? Well, that is right. true. Well, I, I mean, the, the, it's, it's, adds in all those complications. Right, but right? you see, that means it's making the complications rather right. than I guess reducing. It's an yeah. increasing. Right, and so that's why that that's why I'm saying is that there's a tendency to think of it as well. You notice it's not called basic. No, no, it's just called Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Right, yeah, and absolutely. the basic is used in one of the blurbs on the front, but that's all. Um, yeah. And the uh, and that's something worth pointing out. Everyone says D and D basic, but what they're think, but it was only uh, Moldvay that's called basic D and D, not yeah. right. Another thing 
that I don't think anyone probably agrees with me about this. But when we played Holmes, we treated race and class as two completely separate things. And we read those descriptions as saying, you can be a dwarf, but if you're a dwarf, you have to be a fighter. Or a thief. Or, right, or whatever the, they are. But the, yeah, it says fighter right. or a thief. For both but athletes. everyone thinks of that line as doing it as what Menser does. And I don't. I think Moldve does it too. I, I, I get confused about the details uh, where there. Where it's its own class. Right. Where dwarf is a class. And right now I went back and I read my, my homes or I got my, my wife in, in her pity got me in old homes <laughs> for Christmas, for Christmas a while ago. And so oh, um, nice. I, 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 I'm, I was making blubbering noises about my own copy being gone <laughs> and you know, it's, well, um, and so uh, I got, I got it and I was reading it and I was saying, did we play it wrong back then? Cause everyone's always talking about like the, the, you say, Oh yeah. Holmes and like, Oh yeah. We're elf is a class. And I was thinking to myself, I don't remember that. And so I went back and I looked and sure enough, I found what seemed to me very coherently stated. Yes, we have these classes. Oh, and if you're this race, then you have these class restrictions. And I found one place where the phrasing is if read in isolation, could be interpreted that dwarf was fighter or was a special kind of fighter or something. It's kind of a, just a sentence, really. Well, just a little know, phrasing, and and you only only makes. And I I gotta say, I have to say, I think Mold Van Menser just mid misread it. Yeah, I think they did. I think you're yeah. right. I mean, they do mention that elves can cast spells like a magic user. So it's it's weird because the dwarves and the halflings, they're it's, like it's specific. You can be a this. fighting man dwarf or a fighting man halfling or a fighting man human. You could be a thief, human, thief, dwarf, thief, halfling. Right. But the elves, it does say they can use all the weapons and armors of the fighting man, including all magical weapons, and can also cast spells like a magic user. So it makes it sound like its own right. thing. Right. But in um, in into the unknown, which is a companion, it right. came with yeah, the it, box. It's in the box, yes. So mm -hmm. in the back of that, it gives you a list of pre-gen characters, right? Um, in case you don't have time, you just want to get right to it. And it's so this is the print right. of the uh -huh. list of characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my brother has the original module. I hope if he didn't. He gave away my old champion stuff and whatnot, so I'm kind of angry at him at the moment. <laughs> so, but here it yeah. says... What, what was all this champion? chatter about champions lately? Oh, yeah. it, it upset me. All right, <laughs> so under Fighting Man, it has Evro, parentheses, Elf, Brandon, parentheses, Human, Zephan, parentheses, Dwarf, Thief, parentheses, Halfling, Human, Elf, Dwarf. So every single one of these classes, except Claire. All the clerics are human, but every single one, nope. And then magic users have to be human or elf. And then thieves can be anything and fighting men can be anything. Right. So, right. I mean, it basically it, it, it says does see, uh -huh. it's not a, yeah, it's a restriction, right. not a, not Correct. a class in and of itself. No. Right. That, that was my understanding. And so I was always, now I never encountered Moldve. And I did encounter the, the, the most common version of Menser, which is the 1985 one. Um, and I actually played that with kids when I was working in a neighborhood center in Chicago. And I liked it, but I was, first of all, it was the first time I encountered what I think of as entirely sanitized d and I was kind of oh, like, sure. where's all the tits? You know? Right. <laughs> where, right. Where, 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 where's my devil warship? You know, <laughs> I've never so, seen the text, right. so I don't and know. So what they, how they it's, do well, it's, it's it's actually really professional. I'll say, I mean, that the Menser material is deeply beautiful, deeply professional, really, really nicely laid out. Just you can really prize it as a gaming artifact, and just like anything in this entire line, all the way up through the the cyclopedia, it's eminently usable. This, mm -hmm. this whole line, if this was the line of D&D, &D, yeah, if this was the line of D&D &D and we never had the whole AD&D &D thing, 
I would praise it to the skies as one of the classic, most best designed, you know, fully understandable, why are we here, what do we do, lines of games there is. Um, it's weird parallel with the other line, which has its other features, is, you know, a matter of history, obviously, and fascination. Right. But the, the Holmes text, to me, is more than just the precursor to Moldvay and Menser. It is its own thing with its crazy... Um, you know, you can make your character and everybody can be imagining them as cartoons. Have you ever seen mm. the early 80s cartoon of D&D? No, oh, I watched it as Oh, okay. Happens. All right. Yeah, I am. It's charming. It's actually pretty charming. That's um, awesome. I mean, I was. what's your take? I mean... Well, I mean, I have not watched it since 1980 mm -hmm. oh, okay. or five or whenever it came out, so I don't know. So I don't, I don't have an opinion as yeah, that a, would be that would uh, be interesting adult. to see. Yeah, but the the point I'm making is that of all the versions of D and D, Holmes is the only one that I could see producing that oh, cartoon. That's interesting. It's the only one that's got the sort of sprightly. My character could be drawn like a relatively right. simple cartoon character with the personal features that makes a cartoon character fun. You know, my character's the funny guy. My character's, you know, it's like the different right. turtles or something. That's and you could actually do it. And it it has... Now, whether you think that's a virtue or whether, you know, your your sense of Arthurian slash, you know, <laughs> your, your Arthurian, Tolkien, Moorcock, you know, sensibilities are offended by me saying that, you know, why not? But, but to I me... I know, but... There is an element of D and D ness that that purports sure. to you know be the only thing that really cares about these sure. things. So I, um, for myself, find it. Oh, and it's completely divorced from any franchise material. It's completely divorced, Jesus. right? Completely divorced from a setting. Yeah, and that's actually kind of important because. Um, Willy-nilly, and I'm not talking about Greyhawk, willy-nilly play culture of D&D &D gained a setting composed of convention modules and their implications about what characters were and how they went and what they did. And now, granted, they would pick like a hex in the world of Greyhawk and claim that their module was like in that hex. Right. and that's some, But that's, right. that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about setting as a way to inform play. Setting as as a, a summary or as a background set of principles by which the situations of the play felt confirmatory of it. I see. That's what I mean. And yeah. frankly, that's only the only thing setting can ever be. And right. so, um, map or no map, history or no history. Yeah. And so the uh, the take that I I mean I actually lay this out in theoretical terms in circle of hands. I'm actually really I'm oh. I'm, I'm big about there's. There's backdrop. Yeah, there's there, there's there's three levels. Blah blah blah. Right. So okay. what I'm I'll, saying I'll be is, reading that soon. Then go cool. on. <laughs> um, the yeah. the fun part of Holmes for me in that regard is that if you jump in with nothing but these weird little things about setting, and you can't even go. It doesn't even have the monster manual sense of orcs do this. You know, nope. dragons do that. Here are the dragons. Holmes is far more paint on a wall as far as any yeah. of those go. And you get the idea that if you want to throw some paint at the wall too, then, you know, you and Holmes are kind of like there together. You know, he's got his paint bucket. You walk up next to him with yours and he's like, hey, buddy. <laughs> you know, and that, that's absolutely right. true. That's, that's yeah, my, that's, my sense. Yeah. He invites you to make up your own monsters as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like you need mm -hmm. to give him these stats and you're good to go. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I mean everything about yeah. the game just sort of invites you to to add on right in your own way. And so to me that is the the moment when it was the most charming or desirable to play. And I was a disappointed customer of the player's handbook and the DM guide. I was a Inter yeah. even in 1970. Yes, I, oh yeah, well I sp I graduated from high school in 1983. And if you Excellent. look at my high school notebooks you can watch my 
my I, I like have paragraphs. I'm like reading the Fawford Mouser books over and over again and saying this is not that. That's interesting. This so is not that. So you became an angry that. young man in 1983. I read Harlan Ellison's Glass Teat in 1977. Okay. So I think I well, had some modeling for that. You about the state of the role playing, right? I that was. I, I don't know how angry I was. I was well, actually I was in the sense that I said D and D is not for me, uh, and I basically I had maybe I was much much more enamored. I realized during that period, and I remember I wasn't role playing much. I That's did my role playing reading. in middle school or what we call junior high, as you will recall, and then we. Uh, and then in high school, I didn't have time, and I was like, you know, and, and a lot of us at that point were kind of like, we weren't gamers in the sure. modern sense. We had played it, and we liked, and games. we read yeah. fantasy and all the rest of it, but a lot of us were kind of like, yeah, I tried D&D, you know, I really don't like all that dungeon -y stuff. It doesn't work. Because we read Fafra and the Mouser, and we were going, right. this is the shit. This is right. this that is it. That was the experience you were looking to recreate, right? Not, right, and, not and or at least or or make. And so, yeah. um, and anybody who said, "Well, you could," and I was like, "Yeah, well, find me a group," because there isn't right. one. And so, um, and I was outside of the tournament scene. I didn't live in Lake Geneva, you know, or anywhere. I didn't live in the D and D belt with its big, you know, vibrant convention thing. I didn't live in a place where there was somebody who had, you know, who got alarms and excursions, you know, and could sort of serve as the local guru. And, um, and I was, you know, and, and, the, and the, the hot women I knew who were into role-playing were playing uh, you know, Glorantha. They were playing RuneQuest. Yeah. Right. And so, um, so I, I kind of burned out on the, on, I was like, you know, role-playing isn't really what I want. Mm -hmm. And I and, and I and every time I went back and read stuff, I kept picking up Wizard. Oh. This booklet came out in 1977. Melee. Oh yeah, right. absolutely. Note. Yeah. Note the cock and balls on the gargoyle. I I was just <laughs> reading your essay, Naked Came yeah. the Gamer, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. I and just then, read it yesterday. In fact. Oh really? And then this. Came yeah. out the next year, Wizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh -huh. and uh, they're skirmish games, and yeah. uh, I have them in the same packet now. Um, crappy old plastic packets, um, and uh, but they came separately. They were, and so uh, I kept going back to Wizard, and I bought the fantasy or the, the in the labyrinth, the role playing game for it uh -huh. when it came out in 1980. Gotcha. And that fascinated me. That was the one that I dug into and said, if I'm going to play a role-playing game, this is going to be it. That's this is my thing. And um, and ultimately, the fantasy trip, I would have said, was my game. Um, that was the one. And, but ultimately, though, even as time went by after that, I actually liked Wizard better than in the Labyrinth. I never left the underground when it came to my love of science fiction and fantasy on comics. And I, cause I only liked Marvel when it was effectively an underground company right. or when the people in it were getting away with shit under the editorship. I see um, what you're saying. That's uh, I only like Marvel when it wasn't, you know, <laughs> right. when it no, wasn't itself. Sense. And so, um, uh, so, and I never lost my sense of being engaged with the people who make things um, and watching with some grief to see their love of the thing or their sense of identification with the audience disappear. It was a lot like in academia, watching my friends fight for tenure, get tenure, and then you watch their love of what they're doing kind of get whittled away gotcha. in almost a completely opposite trajectory. Right. And it was a little bit like that with a lot of people I saw get into comics as pros. And you could see that they lost the ability to see why anybody would like it. Right. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. And, and, and that colored the way that you approached RPGs as a oh, profession? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. which is to say that I, as I have said many times, that I consider designing games to be a subset of avidly playing them. And I see publishing games to be a subset of design. And I actually see that as I, as I joke as a progressive personality disorder, (laughs) you know, because a perfectly, a person who just likes role playing is going to be happiest if they just get to do a lot of it. What is with this design thing? Clearly something is wrong with you. (laughs) And, and then the need to publish it. And then the need to publish it. It's like, no, that's the severe form. That's that's when, <laughs> you know, the intervention has to come in then, you know, stop that. So, um, yeah, I I kind of feel that all that's true. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, yeah, but the, that sense, though, you know, has, has not left me. And no, I, you could see that. Work. Yeah. But the... The other frustration that I have is, uh, well, with fandom, is that if you bought it and we all do it because we're fans of it, then we have to think it's great. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I always have embraced about comics, music, and science fiction and fantasy is not that there's all this shit and you have to find the good stuff, but rather that you're always trying and the more you try and the harder you try and the things you try to do, there are going to be weird confluences of success and failure scattered all the way through. No, you're exactly right. That it's and, that you can see the gems of, of the, the same work can have shit and brilliance in it sure. at the same time. Well, and also there are things that just aren't easily classified that way. There are things right. where you are like, you know what? If you talk about the experimental style that Carl Edward Wagner used in a certain percent of the Kane stories, okay, where the experimental style uses a lot of exclamation points and a lot of ellipses, okay, so he's trying for kind of a beat poetry in your face approach, especially to the combat, right? It doesn't work, it doesn't. Okay. And it's 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 actually kind of painful, but you can see him trying, right? And you get what he's after. He doesn't want yeah, to yeah. write fantasy combat the way that everybody writes fantasy combat. Right. He's trying That's something, and it goes with kind of like motorcycle gang balls to the wall acid trip stories that are the Kane saga anyway. And so, um, so I kind of I'm okay with it. You know what I mean? I don't yeah, say okay. Oh, that's yeah. the failed part. That's the bad part of the Kane books. You have to. Here's the here's the fan the, the fandom phrase. Get past it. Yeah, that's not the way I yeah. look at it. No, and I think I, that's really you're right. You're absolutely right, and I think that is part of a training of before science fiction became cool and right. You right. Were constantly having to do that. Right. Yeah. No, of that's course, really- of course. I mean, anybody who's ever read an Ellison collection of short stories. You know, it's like being buffeted by a wind of what works and what doesn't, almost by the paragraph. And so, um, I mean, it's also, I mean, just think of the era. This is the era when you could write mainstream books full of sex. Right. And how, and you go back and read that stuff. I mean, you go back and read like the sex scenes in books that were supposed to be like the ultimate groundbreaker of like sex, mainstream sex. Fear of flying. Woman can't write sex to save her life. (laughs) <laughs> but but it's trying to put it all out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's trying to put it all out there. And so um, it's it's a good, I mean, that's just one good example because everybody tried, right? Up until right. then, like Norman Mailer could hint at it. And everybody says that was edgy, but he's Norman Mailer. You know, yeah. after, after some point, 1969 or something like that, right about that point, you know, the door just flew open and every single science fiction story is just reeking with sex all the way through. Right. And mainstream books too, you know, there's... God, Judy Bloom's Forever, her story for like... Uh, no, she wrote she wrote one book for like teens, like okay. late teens called Forever. Gotcha. Because most of her books were for, for tweens. Right. right? But the, there's Forever, which was made into a TV special. Which everybody uh-huh. like the whole world like had to had to see it because it's naughty, and uh, and then she wrote one called Wifey, which was like the grown up one. 
Um, and so, I'm well, with Lacey. what I'm guess I'm trying to get at is that this is a period when every kind of literature and music was struggling with the sudden opportunity. And I'm just picking sex in this particular case, Ooh, but with yeah, lots of things, lots of things for which there was very, very little template of actually how to do it. And there was also this somewhat admirable, often much more so in the breach than the observance of authenticity. Right. The deep attempt toward authenticity, right. which I actually found much more charming even when it fell on its face. And Marvel yes. comics are an excellent example. People talk now about the cringeworthy black characters of the late 70s. You go back and read them and you can see that there's actually some pretty strong shit in there. That all of your 80s characters, who are these bland, action hero, lethal weapon black characters, can't even begin to touch. Right. You know, even though, yes, if you count, you know, if you read the euphemisms for black slang and stuff like that in the late 70s comics, yeah, you can, you, you kind of laugh, but you also say they weren't going to get anything else out. That wasn't, right. you know, they, they, they couldn't put in the actual the words. They had. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, and we all knew what sweet Christmas, we all knew what he meant when he said sweet Christmas. It wasn't a joke. We just right. knew that's what he was saying. And we just went on from there. Right. So, um, it was to me, uh, I mean, I, have tried never to, I've, I don't think I've ever lost that. That when you are creative, you put it out there and you watch it stumble and, you just go yeah. right ahead. But that's where, no. where Holmes came in. And I actually, so my, to go back to the D&D &D thing, I think that it is uh, worthwhile to go back and look at Holmes and play it. I really do. It, it really, it, for one thing, it's almost like the, it's like, it's like the bucket of cold water to the fictional saga of D&D. &D. And role playing, yeah, you know, and 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 I was delighted when a sector of the nominal OSR sort of spoke up for Holmes, mm. and I could be be mistaken in this, but I still think they're considered the weirdos of the bunch. Like everybody right? else who's into D and D looks at them as like Holmes, but Menser's way better. You know, Menser fixed it. Menser made a real game out of it. So, but then you had Blue Holm come out, one of the OSR publications. Yeah, I it's saw called Blue that. Holm. I haven't, I haven't read so, it. And uh, so, and I think that that is sort of the nexus point of people who, you know, defiantly or humorously or with whatever perspective say, yeah, I like that. I like that little weirdo. Yeah. Um, however, I will say that at least the G plus group that I'm part of has a tendency to plaster on a lot more on top of, oh, on top of the box. So their version of Holmes, as they see it, is much, much, much bigger. I see. Even though I consider most of that material to be, well, it, it has accrued in the intervening period, but I'm not sure I really see it as, you know, part of the game. Right, it's critical um, to Holmes. But uh, I do... Yeah, I, I, I think that it is well worth the fantasy role player's time to I consider, yeah, to consider Holmes by itself to be part of those early fantasy games like Dragon Quest, mm. The Fantasy Trip, Melanda, um, Tunnels and Trolls, Early Room mm. Quest, Chivalry and Sorcery. Uh, I did a Monday Lab. That was about the the seventies fantasy games, oh, and cool. um, and and Holmes deserves to be in there without the baggage of being part of TSR and I part of Dungeons and Dragons as the standalone game, just as right. its own game. Call it what it, call it what you will. The blue book, the blue game. Right. You know, just call it that, and right. you might be a little surprised at where it stands relative to those games not where it stands relative to D&D. &D. Right.
I guess that's well, I really, it. Yeah. I appreciate your staying up extra late to have this yeah, conversation. It's been a while since we. It's been a while since we had a conversation. We had two. It has been. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I really I appreciate it. Yeah. Have a All good right. time with everything. Thank yeah. you very much. It was yeah. it was a lot of fun. I really appreciate. Always it. Always is, Jason. Take care. Thank you. All right. Take care.